what is privilege and how do I, we enjoy it unknowingly? Uh, Michelle is a, um, has been a member of North Avenue for a number of years, along with her husband, Larry, and their two daughters. And uh, I was looking at, at the pictures that you posted of Tori thinking, oh my gosh, she's humongous because I have not seen her for a year as we have not seen the children in our congregation for a year. So I think we're all going to be shocked by how everyone has grown over the course of the last year when we finally do get to be together again. But Michelle, uh, you've been involved in women's Bible study for a number of years now. You've been on our leadership team. Um, you've been involved with the uh, women's retreat. Um, and now you're involved in the leadership of the Speak Easy Sunday School Discipleship class. Um, so we're excited to have you leading us this morning um, in our Call to Reconciliation series. And, and I asked you if you would lead on on a discussion of privilege and how we enjoy privilege um, unknowingly often. Uh, and, and you come from a, a unique vantage point in that you are married to a black man, you have biracial children. And, um, and so it was our thinking that you would have a unique perspective on that for us. Uh, and I know that you do. So let me pray for you and we'll give you um, the floor. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise that you've given us this time to be together. We thank you for this forum, for this opportunity to lean into some of the questions that define terms and explain concepts to us as we continue to um, lean into a call to reconciliation as followers of Jesus. As your word says, that as we are reconciled to God, may we also be reconciled to one another. So we come before you this morning, Lord, um, out of obedience, seeking to more deeply understand reconciliation, the gift that you have given to us by reconciling us to yourself through the sacrifice of Jesus and now calling upon us to be reconciled to one another. I pray your blessing over Michelle as she leads us. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hello, church. I'm excited. A um, little nervous about this conversation, but mostly excited. Um, I am convinced that healthy families talk about their problems. And I remember last year when our church family had a black man preach, a professor who brought it, I mean, brought it. And I remember the absolute tensions that came from that one talk and how we had a town hall meeting following that talk. And I was astonished at what came to light, what, expo what, what kind of exposure came up of our church family. We have racial problems, church, in our church. It's not a problem out there. It is a problem with us, in us. And so I am convinced that the best thing we can do as a family, as a church family, is to lean into our problems. So I thank you for being here. I think you being here says you're in on working on the family problems. So I appreciate it. My hope for this morning, I want to ask you for one big thing. I want you to lean into a holy curiosity. And I want you to take, we're gonna break out in just a second, but I want you to ask yourself if you could be curious about maybe what you don't know, about a different story. Uh, I want you to pause and take one minute right now and I want to ask you this 
When I say the word white privilege, I want you to notice what comes up in your body, your breathing, your mind, your emotions. So take one minute. This is what I'm going to call holy curiosity. Notice what's happening when I say the word white privilege. You're going to take one minute. You're going to share it with a couple people. This is a four minute activity and I'll see you back in just a few minutes. Okay, and we're back. Thank y'all for checking in with your holy curiosity. I was raised in rural Ohio, um, outside of Columbus, and I um, had one black family in my entire town. Um, I remember my entire elementary school uh, having completely a white experience in my school. And it wasn't until high school that I uh, engaged with anyone black in my school, one, 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 one young man. Um, I married a black man um, against my parents' um, blessing. I am raising two little girls who are biracial. One's four and one is seven. I've lived in a black neighborhood, a historically black neighborhood now for about 11 years. Um, I work for FCS, um, Focus Community Strategies here in South Atlanta. And I, do youth engagement work. So I um, create, help create programs, but what I really do is um, facilitate a community of children uh, who are trying to cross racial dividing lines, uh, socioeconomic and racial dividing lines. I have friends on all parts of this spectrum. Uh, I have friends who would have been at the Capitol, storming the Capitol, had they um, gotten that chance. I have friends who are uh, extreme uh, on both sides of um, maybe friends who would be all things Black Lives Matter. And I have uh, friends who um, have voted for Trump every single time and have no problems saying so, um, and all in between. I want to show us from the scriptures, if you want to go to Acts 21 with me, go for it. If not, I'm going to read this real quickly. Um, we see in Acts 21 where Paul's arrested the crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him, he's not fit to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? 
And when the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do? He asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked him, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. And then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. And so what do we see here? We see a, a clear example of privilege. Cultural privilege at play. Him dropping that I am a Roman citizen because he knew that that would matter. That that would keep him alive, potentially. And it did. It kept him alive for several years. Clearly, privilege is real in this example. Even ironically, I might point out that Paul kind of gives us enough in the other scriptures to sort of warn against maybe doing this type of thing. Uh, he was all things about our citizenship is in heaven and um, not hiding behind your names. Uh, and yet in a moment of chaos, Paul drops his privilege and it's real. And then we know that the systems of privilege in our world exist. We have gender privilege. We know that statistically men make more money than women. Uh, it doesn't take long to look those statistics up or to find the proof in all of that. I know personally what it's like to be a woman in ministry and be excluded from the table time and time and time again, just by being a woman. We know that wealth is a privilege. We know that wealth gets you things that uh, you don't get when you're impoverished. Um, I go to a chiropractor and it has been something that has been bothering me for years that my friends who make considerably less money are not afforded any type of resources like chiropractic care because they are not wealthy. We know American culture exists. If you've traveled outside the United States, you know that you can use English language anywhere in the world and get by. We don't have to learn other languages. We can, we are Americans, we get to use English. That's been my experience. And of course, white privilege. I'm just gonna summarize white privilege as a system a system where social and economic experiences benefit white people and disadvantage black and brown people. Our country has a long history of slavery. We have a long history with slavery and segregation rules where white people from the beginning have benefited by oppressing brown and black people. And there has been a system that has resulted in, let's give an example of the wealth gap. Today, the median income for a black household is less than 60, per, a little less than 60% of white households. So an, on average, a, a white family makes $71,000, a black family on average makes $41,000. The poverty rate for black Americans is more than double that of white. Why is this? When you have wealth and you own a home, you have the ability uh, automatically to have uh, more wealth than those that don't own a home. Um, my, my parents, uh, inherited the homes of their parents, which set them up to be well-resourced. Uh, they also got an inheritance on top of the sale of the home. Uh, they uh, 
uh, had gone to college, so they had the earning power um, to get a good job. And therefore, when I came along and my siblings came along, we were supported. We were in a wealth, a wealthy situation. Uh, and therefore, generationally, like I uh, was also afforded the privilege to go to college and um, will inherit my parents' home and and um, and that will be passed down to my children. I own a home now with my husband and my kids are um, well supported by our earning power. But friends, if you were a slave coming out of slavery with little to no wealth, you're already starting at a disadvantage. And how, how many people started that way? Um, whereas you had a, a direct uh, comparison of wealth for white people who owned slaves and were on plantations and accumulated wealth while black and brown people couldn't. Take, a, take time to just look at inequity statistics today. If you are curious and you access your holy curiosity, I guarantee you it will not take you long to be alarmed at statistics alone. Home ownership, earning power, infant, infant mortality rates, health discrepancies, mass incarceration numbers of black and brown people. And then look at books, movies, art, actors, commercials, dance. Notice in your life how often you see yourself in all of those things. And notice if I was a brown or black person, would I feel the same way? Am I as equally represented here? So let's be honest. We get tangled up and our entanglements come. I'm going to tell you where I see it, um, but it kills off our holy curiosity. Here's what I see. Now, I have seen this in myself and I've seen it amongst my friends, family members and general population of white people. I'm not racist. I'm not a racist. Overt racial comments. I don't say nigger. I don't do that. I have black friends. I love black people. I've never done. I've never stormed the Capitol like that. My husband is black. I don't, I don't see color. I love everyone. Why can't we just all get along and why can't we just all love each other? We don't need to talk about race. We need to talk about Jesus. Why am I being attacked? I, I have had struggled too. I've had to work hard for what I have. Why am I being attacked for being white? I say those things for us to be aware that we, if we're honest, we've likely said one or more of those or thought that. And I want you to be curious about how that, how those statements and those mentalities can gaslight the conversation that really needs to happen. When last year our um, neighborhood became very literally on fire, figuratively on fire, when Richard Brooks was murdered by a police officer, I remember. Um, waiting for my parents 
thinking they would surely call to check on us. And days went by and I was very disappointed. Nobody had checked on us and um, in my family. And I remember having a conversation with my father pretty quickly into the conversation. He said, well, you know, what we aren't talking about that we should be talking about is the white people that have been murdered by police officers as well. And I remember cutting him off and saying, dad, please stop and listen to what you're saying. It is not helpful to this situation for you to ask me to look at another situation. We have to be more curious. We have to listen better. And we have to stop saying things like the, that list that distract, that gaslight the conversation. My own personal experiences, I think, are probably the thing that is probably the most helpful to this conversation. Um, I, I married Larry, and I remember what it was like yesterday. It was like it was yesterday for me. I remember being in the office at my parents' home. And I remember um, wanting so badly for my parents to meet this man that I had become crazy about. And I knew that him being black was a problem for them. And I remember in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, just my dad and I in his office, I said, dad, can you tell me what do you see when you see a black man? And tears started to form and my dad put his head down and he looked back up and he said, a man who cheats on his wife, a man who leaves his family, abandons his children. And I think he said maybe a couple more things, but that was the, the what I remember. And I remember being flooded with, wow, dad. No wonder you don't want me to marry Larry. If you think that's going to happen, of course you don't want that to happen. Of course that scares you. Would you get to know Larry? Would you just get to know him? And with tears coming down my father's cheeks, he said, I don't know. And he shook his head and he just said, I don't know. I don't know if I can. The color of my husband's skin represented a man who cheats on his wife and leaves his family to my father. And it's not just my dad. My dad didn't get there by himself. My dad's not an evil man. I know what it was like as a married couple when we went to see the loving movie in the movie theaters. And I remember what it was like to want to crawl into like a fetal position and sob over the reality that what Larry and I had experienced in this union of marriage was declared illegal. And not only like, a long, long, long time ago, like 1967, that's 10 years before I was born. I know what it's like to go in certain places in Alabama and people look at us and stare at us like we are at the zoo. I also know what it's like to be pulled over in a car by speeding as a white woman. 
And while my heart will race when I get pulled over because I know I'm getting a ticket, that's what I'm afraid of is getting a ticket. Never once in my life have I feared where my hands would be when I got pulled over. Never in my life have I ever feared that I would lose my life for being pulled over. And yet, my husband and many, many, many of our Black friends and family members have had an opposite experience. When we were married, Larry made it very clear that if he, if I was to ride in the car with him ever, I needed my identification. I needed my ID. Why? You know how many times I've just gone about my business and not checked if I have ID? It's a privilege as a white person. I remember Larry worked um, a very early morning shift. And at this particular day, I had to take him to work. We had one car, one was probably in the shop. And it was about five in the morning. And we drove together, he was driving. We drove out of the neighborhood and just out, right as we were about to get on the interstate, we were stopped. Why? Um, that was something I learned is that in, in our area, um, the police just come and start barricading and checking IDs, just stopping people. Never ever in my life, when I've lived in a uh, uh, mostly white community, have that, that's never happened to me. So this particular morning, we're, we're pulled over and, um, and we have no idea why. And the white cop, starts immediately getting uh, like loud and aggressive with Larry. And I remember my heart racing. I remember my body just being absolutely flooded with fear. Like why, why is, why is he, like, I don't know why he's yelling what's happening. It was very, it was moving very fast. Um, my husband uh, was angry because of how he was being treated. And so he was noticeably angry. His body language showed that he was angry and frustrated. And I remember thinking all the things maybe a black mom might feel. Uh, don't, don't say another word. Don't say another word, Larry. Just listen. Just take this. And we, like, I just remember, like, wanting to, like, hold his hand and just silence him. Don't say another thing. And I remember uh, that moment being kind of foggy now because I don't even know how we ended up leaving. Um, I just remember being yelled at and um, and then somehow it it died down and we were able to go, but it was a very scary experience. I also know what it's like to walk in my neighborhood on a street with no sidewalks and my two little girls uh, with us and a cop, a white cop pulls up and starts yelling at us for not being on a sidewalk, except there was not a sidewalk to be on. I remember my children starting to cry immediately and asking if we were going to jail. Ask your children if they're afraid of the police. Mine are at a very young age. I'm curious, I'm truly curious what your experience is. I have family that um, has never, their children are, my nieces and nephews don't feel afraid of the police. Several years ago, we had an experience uh, with a teenager in our youth group who was pregnant. Uh, we had no idea she was pregnant until she asked me to take her to the hospital. Um, she was in labor and I didn't know she was having a baby until uh, 
someone at the hospital said we're headed to labor and delivery. Um, it was a crazy experience. Um, and um, to summarize it very uh, succinctly, she was in an unsupported situation with her family um, and kept her pregnancy a secret until she was delivering. At that point, I had had um, my daughter, Savannah, who's seven. Uh, I knew what it was like to have a baby. Um, and what I can tell you is that her experience as a young Black woman was radically different than my experience in labor. She was treated as um, a number, another teenage pregnancy, so sad, um, treated with like pity and no help. I remember uh, literally advocating right and left for somebody to get in the room. Uh, she is about to, this baby is coming and there is no doctor around. I remember yelling down the hallway to get a doctor in here immediately. And then I remember what it was like. She lived with us for a time and we went to social service, appointment after social service appointments, um, trying to get her set up in all the ways. And I remember her trying to stand up and go talk to somebody, um, advocate for herself to no end. Um, it was amazing to me how people didn't listen to her. And I remember getting up and stepping in and saying almost the exact same thing that she would say. And people started moving for me. People started getting things done for me. Now, you can't tell me that that's my imagination. That's, that's like a direct, radically different outcome. Why? Because of uh, us taking her in, uh, there was a situation with her family where she, her mom didn't approve of us supporting her and helping her. And she took me to court. And um, unfortunately, uh, a judge found that there was probable cause that I had aided in this young woman's, um, uh, that I had aided in her as a runaway. Um, even though none of that happened, it was a situation that was done through defects. Um, I was detained. I was arrested uh, that day in court, and I was uh, I, I was a one week pregnant. Um, come to find out, I was terrified, and I'm being. Um, you know, escorted to this area of the courtroom. I don't know what's going to happen next. I don't know if they're going to put handcuffs on me. I don't know if I'm going to jail. I don't know. I just know I'm in the process of being arrested. And they asked me, um, no, I asked the, uh, I asked the security officer because I'm, I'm, I'm terrified and I'm looking around. My attorney is like shaking her head. Like she's in disbelief that this is happening. And I look at this black security officer and I said, am I going to jail right now? And he said, have you ever been arrested? And I said, no. And he said, hey, do you have a record? And I said, no. And he's like, you're not going anywhere. You're going to go home today. So I did. I um, had what um, legally is called a I forget what it's called actually, but it's, it's different than house arrest, but I, I was, um, as long as I didn't travel outside of the city, um, I just had to go to my, uh, court dates and check in with my probation officer and work this system. I remember going in the first time, uh, to one of my appointments in a room full of people. I was the only white person and I remember thinking, this cannot be, this cannot be right. 
I remember what it was like to be a criminal and the way that I was treated, herded into um, lines and people don't make eye contact with you. And um, I remember having to set up an appointment to ask permission if I had to travel at all. Being a criminal in our country is uh, feels like being an animal. Well, the rest of that story is a story for, for another day. Um, I, I remember when I was, when I have had my first daughter, Savannah, and I remember being at a circle time at a library um, and all these moms and kids and uh, something that happens to me all the time with my children is that I get asked if they're my children. I would ask you as a white mom if, or a white dad, if you've ever been asked if your children are yours. The question comes so often that this particular day at the circle time at the library, a woman caught me on a bad day and she said, are they, is she yours? And I said, with all the sass in, in my body, I said, she sure is. And just looked at her, she sure is. And she said, whoa, I've offended you. And I paused and I said, let's start over. I'm Michelle, what's your name? I said, you gotta understand here. I have been asked that question for so many times and you actually have no idea. I actually had an infertility journey trying to get pregnant. So here I have this child, she is mine, but now I'm asked all the time if she is mine. And you know, she's a baby right now, so she's not hearing this question all the time, but when she's a little girl and people ask if I'm her mom over and over again, she's gonna ask me, mom, why do they ask that? And I said, so I'm just tired of the question. Because she looks different than me, you assume she's not mine. And this mom, like, eyes like this, said, I'm so sorry. And I will not make this mistake again. And I just said, well, thanks for listening. And I saw her the next week at the next library circle time. And she said, you know, I went home and I told all my friends and I told all my family and they're not going to make this mistake again either. <laughs> she said, thank you for educating me. <laughs> my daughter went horseback riding with a white friend and this white friend posted my daughter horseback riding on Facebook. And one of her friends commented on the picture and said, wow, what a blessing that she gets to go horseback riding. I'm, you're helping her so much in her life, giving her these types of experiences. And I thought to myself, this woman assumes that my child has never been horseback riding. Based on what? She's brown. Hmm. I know what it's like to live in a neighborhood where there aren't always sidewalks or sidewalks are horrible. And when I go to other neighborhoods and there's beautiful sidewalks, and lots of attention to fixing sidewalks, I wonder, what is it about my neighborhood? Why don't I get the nice sidewalks? Doesn't take long to realize when you live in the south side of Atlanta, things aren't always the same as the north side of Atlanta. 
everything from bus stops or lack of bus stops to how long does it take on an emergency call for someone to respond? Why don't we have the same kind of restaurants that other neighborhoods have? Why don't we have retail stores? And um, why are the billboards um, always a certain type of uh, derogatory um, message? There's a lot of assumption here about this billboard, and the placement of this billboard. And then in my work, I've noticed, why are all the nice camps, the nice summer camps filled with white children instead of brown children? Why is it that when we circle up on a given Wednesday night that the people who are celebrating, we do a, a rhythm of celebration, who has something to celebrate tonight? What do you have to celebrate tonight? Why is it that predominantly the white children are saying about a vacation that they got to go on? Well, and I want to say is, you know, being a part of a youth group um, here in South Atlanta has been one of the best privileges of my life. I, I get to experience this um, community of white and brown and black kids where the lines that divide us in the world are very present in our, in our little community. Um, wealth differences and uh, family differences, experience, different experiences of all kinds. And, and we get this beautiful opportunity to press in and try to be friends across all these lines. And it is, I would say the best, some of the best work I've ever done in my life, but it is, it is hard work. It is very hard to dismantle these dividing spaces. And it is, it is um, beyond challenging at times, but it is so beautiful when it happens. When I see kids who do not, they, they would not sit in the cafeteria together. Uh, their families probably would not hang out and yet, when I see friendship blossom between these types of kids and in, in, when they form relationships and they can be sometimes as simple as helping one another out or encouraging one another with a good word. Um, and sometimes it can blossom into more, but sometimes it's just what is it like to be around people that are different? What is it like to be in a community where you actually talk about being different? Where you're able to name questions that you have that you feel maybe afraid to ask in the world. A chance to, to name what you feel, um, a chance to talk about what's currently happening in the world. And I tell people all the time, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, what, what we're trying to do in youth group, in this little youth community, is what the world ought to be doing. And I don't say that as, as an arrogant leader. I just say that to say, you know, if we can do this, so can the world. And the, the world could learn from what's happening in our little youth group in the 30315 zip code. I know we have a few minutes and I wanna ask you to go in a small group and I want you to answer three questions. Do you ever remember a time when you were first aware of your skin color? For our brown and black friends, um, most have a very distinct 
remembrance. Um, but some of us that are white, we may never have even realized our skin color until forced to. Do you see any specific ways you benefit from white privilege in this country? And what would be a next step for you in helping dismantle the system of white privilege? Thanks for listening and please uh, come back after the small group for just a brief word. Welcome back. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Yes, we can. Uh, okay. Um, thanks for the journey in this hour. It was totally unfair to only have an hour. I just wanna say that. Um, but we, I hope with, uh, that your holy curiosity got stirred and I hope that you will continue with it. Um, there are a list of books I have on my mind. So I, I wish I would have done that before this moment, but I'll send that, I can get those sent out to everybody. Um, but I just wanted to end with a final word and a prayer and I'll stick around if there's anybody that has a question for me, okay? Michelle, I wanna thank you before you pray. I just wanna thank you for, um, how disarming your presentation was, how inviting it was. There were folks in my little small group just now so grateful for the way in which you offered your story, um, not from a place of defensiveness or anger, but simply from a place of experience. You, you have helped us a lot. And uh, I was told that we should use you more often. So thank you so much for your, <laughs> for your time with us this morning. Oh boy. I got a lot of sass, so be careful what you ask for. Um, Jesus, we are um, wanting to join you in the holiness of being in your family and what it's like uh, to be included always. And we acknowledge that white privilege is a thing, it's real, and we are we ask and we beg of you to continue to teach us the way in dismantling it, that we would all belong, that there would be truly shalom, no one excluded, no one oppressed. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Yeah. Ben. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks so much for coming, folks. We look forward to having you back next week for the next installment of our Called to Reconciliation series. Thank you. Thank you.